Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our next installment of webinars on all things Nautobot. Uh, this one, we're going to be diving into Nautobot jobs. So let's give us a couple of moments to see everyone start filtering in and make sure that we're good to go. We'll start probably about a minute or two after the top, uh, after mid, after top of the hour. It's not 9 a.m., it's 9.30. So around 9.32 is when we'll be kicking things off. Um, welcome, welcome, everybody. I know we've had some some nice discussions over the past couple uh, days in uh, our public Slack or our community Slack and kind of uh, discussing not about jobs, how our different inputs are and how we can best manage those and some, some nice examples. Um, so it's, it's really great that we're taking this, this opportunity, especially right after we have these nice discussions. Great, looking like we're around 30 on our attendees list. Give about another minute and we'll get everything kicked off and ready to go. We got some cool demos set up and kind of showing the day in the life of what it can be like to be a network engineer that you may have some scripts and, and how those can get translated into not about jobs. We are planning on doing a follow-up uh, jobs webinar where we'll go into uh, more advanced topics on jobs at a later date. Not yet scheduled or planned, but that is one of the items that as we were building the content, we thought, you know, an hour is not a, it's not a true, that's not gonna give us the ability to do true justice uh, for the power of not a bot job. So we will go into, uh, into that in, in more detail at a, at a later time. All right, so we are two minutes past. We're around 40 uh, participants. I say we go ahead and get this ball rolling. So again, welcome everyone. Uh, here We're here today to talk about simplifying your automation with Nautobot jobs, and basically how you can use Nautobot to provide a self-service form, an API for any type of existing automation scripts. Um, that's something that we may have as like our own little uh, individual scripts. Um, in the background for, for what we do on our daily tasks and how we can centralize them inside a Nautobot. So kind of high level of what we're planning for today, we're gonna to go through some introductions. Uh, we're gonna talk about the day in the life uh, and when you're getting started with network automation, because we all understand that this is a journey and it's not just a simple product that you go out and buy or you install or you sit in a, a one week seminar on like, EVPN and VXLAN, and you come back and you're all ready to go and you're the master of that technology. It's an overarching journey and we take a lot of steps along that way. And we showcase how we can use Nautobot jobs to help enrich what we may have already done early in our journey. And then we'll dive a little bit deeper into uh, some of the additional features of jobs pertaining to scheduling and approval and job hooks. And lastly, we've got some really cool demos that are, that are set up for us. I'll go first on intros and then I'll kick uh, hand it over to uh, John, but my name is Jeremy White. I'm the principal developer advocate for Networks Code. Uh, I'm sure you've probably seen me in some uh, live stream videos and uh, inside of com our community Slack workspace. Uh, love all things network automation, been doing it for a handful of years now and a lot of experience in uh, large enterprise environments. It was very interesting uh, geographically dispersed or control zones and how, how to take a brownfield uh, environment to a greenfield environment. Thanks, Jeremy. I'm, uh, John Anderson. I am a principal consultant here at Networks of Code, been here um, many years. Uh, and I'm also the product owner of Nautobot, so I am uh, excited to be on my first uh, webinar. I know uh, Jeremy and team have been doing a great job with them, so I'm uh, excited to be a part of it now. And uh, yeah. Sweet. All right. So one thing that we did announce on the last webinar, which was for... Uh, the firewall models is that we are uh, hosting our first ever joint hackathon with the community and network to code. 
Uh, we are also participating in Hacktoberfest for the whole month of October. Um, I actually started dropping in some shout outs into our uh, community Slack uh, workspace in the Hackathon 2020, um, yeah, Hack, Hacktoberfest 2022 channel uh, to kind of showcase some of the early people that are already contributing and especially giving shout outs to our first time contributors. Uh, Chrissy just dropped in the link to the actual official announcement, which was a blog post. Do make sure to kind of keep up to date with that blog post. If anything changes or we get more details, we will be adding that information to the blog post. And we're treating them as two kind of separate events. So the hackathon, we have a dedicated two days where we'll have NTC engineers, your SMEs, to be able to jump in and help out as your advisors. And then for the whole month of uh, October, we are doing uh, Hacktoberfest. So Anything that's within the Nautobot or Networks of Code organization will count towards Hacktoberfest, and then any contributions that you sign up for to do at the hackathon will count towards the hackathon. And for upcoming uh, Nautobot trainings, so do keep in mind that we do offer a 20% off uh, promo code that we do have displayed on the screen here. Uh, we have our Source of Truth and Not About Fundamentals. That's going to be a virtual uh, training course on November 7th through 8th. And then Automating Not About with Python and Ansible, which will also be virtual, and that'll be on November 16th. I see uh, Chrissy's already dropped that into the uh, chat for us. And then do remember to grab the promo code, which is Not About Web 20. All right, John. All Take right, I appreciate it. Appreciate it, Jeremy. And uh, welcome again, everybody. Uh, again, my name is John Anderson, and I'll be uh, taking us through our webinar today on Nautobot jobs. And we'd like to start off with um, kind of framing the set of use cases that we're going to be talking about. And really, this is about a organization's typical journey towards network automation. And in reality, we're somewhere um somewhere kind of early on but not day zero of that automation journey so to to help frame that a little bit further you know we're we're, we're somewhere along the way so to speak so uh if we can imagine we've got our network team and they've discovered that um you know they'd like to start using automation they have uh uh bought into the idea that network automation can be very beneficial uh, both to not only the individual, but the organization's goals in terms of operating the network. Uh, and likely at this point in that journey, uh, we've got uh, several team members that um, you know might already have some level of uh, coding or programming and scripting experience, uh, and some that may have uh, decided to pick up some of that skill set along the way, hopefully with the organization's um, backing and assistance with that. Um, but they have started to develop uh, some scripts that help them with their day-to-day -day tasks, you know, and, and this is really the story, if you're familiar with the term um, uh, RDA or robotic desktop automation, uh, these are scripts that they are executing locally within their own environments. Um, and that is the, the framing of the story today is how can we begin to operationalize these scripts, right? Because when we're operating in that sort of environment, um, you know, it, it can be hard or, or at least challenging to share the work that, that engineers are doing amongst one another. So if someone creates a script to, you know, maybe deploy some VLANs or validate uh, some configuration, other engineers on the team likely want to make use of those, right? And it can be difficult, just as it is with managing the data that backs our, our network automation efforts, it can be difficult to share that if we don't have the proper governance controls in place. So, you know, may, maybe we, we have some Git repositories in place in the organization where we're sharing these scripts today. But even then, it can be difficult, right, because engineers still have to clone those repos down into their local environment to make sure that they're on the right branch. Um, you know, to ultimately to make sure that, the, that we're all using the right, the, the same version of the script, right? Because especially in the context of deploying network configuration, you know, we want to make sure that we're, we're using the appropriate tooling that has been defined within our teams. So that, that's the problem statement, right? Is that we, we live in a world, to, to summarize, we, we live in a world uh, within our journey in our organization where we have begun to build some automation tooling. 
but we have started to realize and identify issues with operationalizing uh, those aspects of using that sort of tooling. And so this is where uh, not about jobs really uh, can begin to shine for an organization. And the reason for that uh, is because we can treat not about as the nucleus of that automation. So at a very high level, the concept is that uh, not about can be a platform for our network automation efforts. If you're familiar with Nautabot, you, you may know it as a data-centric platform for network automation. So we provide uh, within Nautabot a series of uh, data models and features for uh, documenting your network, as well as tracking inventory of assets and things like that, right? Uh, but Nautabot is so much more than just a data platform. It is truly a network automation platform. And to do that, uh, we center that functionality around a thing called jobs, and, that, and that's our focus again today. And basically, this idea is that we take these scripts that our engineers have built, and they're distributed throughout our network and throughout our different teams, and we can centralize all of that code in one place within Nautobot. And what we're going to show today is how we can take the scripts uh, that we have built, and with very minimal effort, port them over into Nautobot and be able to execute them within a centralized environment. And there are several benefits to that proposition uh, around enterprise controls and so forth. But ultimately, it's about um, exposing this functionality in a way that's consumable to the whole team in a distributed environment. So you know, again, to summarize this, so the world we live in is is we've got skill set within the team that we're building some tooling, um, you know, probably some Python scripting, right? That Python is king in network automation, but we lack the operational control over this. So we lack the uh, auditability and the permissions that are necessary in enterprise environments. Um, and, and ultimately, there, there's no good way for the business to consume what we're doing. It's helpful for individual team members but we want to be able to scale this to the whole team and the whole organization. And, and that's really, as we migrate the, the, these toolings that we're building, these scripts into not about jobs, uh, we gain a lot of that uh, ability. So we'll take a quick uh, overview of jobs here, and then we'll get into a little bit and some more advanced features, and then we'll get into the demos, which, is, which I know is what everyone's here for. Uh, but basically, uh, jobs are user definable Python scripts. And so not about provides an execution environment for those, but what we get is the ability to have kind of self-service user input. So we, our jobs can take input and that input is defined as a series of variables that results in dynamic forms uh, that collect that input from users, excuse me. So different jobs can take different input. And the idea is with, that we actually define that in the code itself. And thus, we as job authors do not have to write HTML code or CSS code uh, to be able to display this form uh, and, and offer this as a service to, to other engineers within our organization. We focus on the scripting, the tooling that, that we were doing yesterday, right, on our local machines, the, the actual business logic that's important for um, manipulating data or talking to network devices and so forth. Uh, and by utilizing Nautabot as the platform in, in which we operate those scripts, we get a whole bunch of enterprise grade features uh, uh, free of charge, basically. So some of those governance controls, which are important, uh, are role-based access controls. So we can limit, uh, when, when we make these scripts available to others, we can limit uh, who specifically can execute them and see them. Um, we have uh, approvals, which I'll go a little bit more into depth. So an engineer can request the execution of a job, but someone else may optionally need to come in and approve that execution before anything is actually done. Uh, we have uh, scheduling both in the future and on a recurring basis. Uh, and then there's also administrative configuration. So, you know, I think we, as practitioners, we often try and focus on, on, on the happy path, right? You know, we, we want our automation to be successful, but the reality is the enterprise still needs the control that if, if something were to go wrong, we need a way to quickly um, stop the bleeding, right? So an, an administrator can come in and globally uh, disable a job, you know, prevent it from further execution if, if needed. Uh, and of course, there's flexible logging and auditing controls 
These are both built into the platform and options that authors can consume based on their particular use cases with their jobs. Uh, and then as far as secrets management go, you know, one of the primary things that we do in network automation is deal with the credentials that are necessary to talk to network devices. So Nanobot does have a very uh, extensive feature set around uh, securely and following best practices, being able to manage uh, those secret values through different providers and um, you know, treating first-class citizens, the platforms that, that are they're very good at managing these types of things. Uh, and the execution environment itself uh, is very scalable. There's uh, many different deployment options available to you. Uh, it's simple as when I'm developing, I can run this, this all locally on my machine. Uh, and if I'm a global enterprise, uh, I can deploy multiple worker nodes across, uh, uh, across the planet uh, to be able to scale my execution options and obviously anything in between to, see, to um, meet a particular organization's needs. And a large part of the, of the value proposition of Nanobot Jobs is that you do have, uh, be, being that it's a network automation platform that's backed in network source of truth, that the data component, there's um, very intelligent integrations for access to that data, both for manipulating, maybe you want standardized creation of uh, sites and devices and things like that based on business logic that you define. Uh, or if you want to do data validation and things like that, and that can all be tied to the to the user input that you've got. And, and, and we'll see all examples of that sort of thing in the demos as we go forward. So just a, a, a bit further on the uh, the input options here. So on the right hand side, you know, we've got the the form that a user would see for a particular job, in this case, one that is uh, going to add a VLAN to a device that we select. and. Uh, this is talking about the input variables. So on the right-hand side, uh, we're actually defining the device uh, variable here. And we define that as an object var against the what's called the device model in Nautobot. And this is how we get this dropdown for free. So these devices are defined as assets within Nautobot uh, already, or managed by whatever means our organization has defined. Um, but basically, with this you know, couple of lines of code, uh, and it's all very standardized. It's all documented for development purposes. Uh, we're able to consume that and offer that dropdown so someone can run this job in the context of a particular device and so forth. So how do we, you know, we, we, we want to develop these jobs. How do we get them into Nautobot, right? There's three primary mechanisms for doing this. Uh, I mentioned briefly a moment ago when we're, when we're uh, developing these, uh, often we're doing that locally. So we'd have an instance of Nautobot that's set up and we have multiple ways of supporting that um, primarily uh, via Docker deployments or you do have uh, local install options if, if that suits your fancy. Uh, and then in a production type environment, there's really two primary ways of, uh, uh, of managing this. One would be via synchronization from Git repositories. So we would store our jobs in either one or many uh, Git repositories, just depending on how we want to uh, either distribute that or manage the governance on the, the Git side. So we, what's nice about that, right, is we can have traditional software engineering flows if we so choose around the governance and management of the code itself. Uh, peer reviews of that code and so forth within the context of Git. And then within the Nautobot application, we consume those jobs by syncing that Git repository into the environment. So, so very powerful from that respect. And, and, I was, and, and that is all driven from the web UI, the, the ability to define those repositories and to do those frequent syncs and so forth. One of the more powerful options is uh, to provide jobs as a part of Nautobot apps. And while apps are not the focus of our uh, webinar today, uh, Nautobot is a very flexible platform. And one of the key feature sets that enables that is uh, this app ecosystem. So Nautobot has a pluggable architecture and these apps uh, are both, um, there, there are many in the ecosystem that Network to Code provides in the open source space, uh, but you as an organization, and many of our customers in fact do this, uh, can write your own apps. And one of the feature sets that these apps can provide are the jobs that would be relevant to, to those particular applications. And, and applications can be as simple as only providing a job, uh, which is nice because you, you're actually packaging everything up as a Python module and you can store that uh, in your internal 
um, you know, per perhaps your internal PyPy uh, repository with Artifactory or something like that, uh, which can aid in, in how you choose to deploy Nautabot and so forth. And it can be far more complicated if your app uh, has a targeted uh, feature set and jobs are ancillary to those functionalities, then, then that's okay too. You can do that. So moving into a couple of uh, the more advanced features, we'll, we'll gloss over some of this and you'll see a little bit of it in the demos here, but I do want to call out just a few of these things, approval schedules and job hooks. So approvals are pretty straightforward. Um, these are, uh, you can, this is entirely optional and it's up to the job author and the uh, administrators of the platform, uh, the, the platform being Nautabot as it's deployed within an organization. Uh, you can choose to designate that a job requires an approval. So uh, anytime an engineer wants to execute it, they can provide the input to the job as they normally would here in this uh, lower left-hand screenshot. But you'll see that the, the button actually says uh, request to run. And this would go into an approval queue, excuse me, that you see on the top right here. And users with the specific permission to be able to view and, ap and approve those executions would be able to go into this queue. And in this bottom right screenshot, they'll be able to see the input uh, that the uh, original requester uh, put in. And uh, both users in, in either case have the ability to run the job in a dry run mode. So uh, that is a feature if you're familiar with Ansible where you can, um, you can execute the job without making changes. So if it's a data job, uh, you'll see what would happen, but no changes will actually be made to the data within the system. Uh, and as a job author, you can choose to honor that if you're talking to external systems or devices and so forth. Uh, next up would be scheduling. So um, any sort of uh, you know asynchronous job execution, which is what we're fundamentally talking about, uh, wouldn't be complete without the ability to schedule jobs. Uh, and we have the ability to schedule jobs uh, for execution, both you know, once in the future, which could be helpful uh, for maintenance windows, things like that, uh, or also on a recurring basis. And we have some simple options for to, to help with that um, uh, type of recurring scheduling down here on the bottom. Uh, but we also do support, uh, if you need it, uh, advanced scheduling via the, the ability to specify a uh, custom cron tab uh, for things. And that was a feature that was added in um, not about 1.3.10. Uh, if you're uh, looking for that sort of thing in an earlier release, um, that, that is available now uh, as of that version. One of the more powerful features related to jobs that is relatively new uh, shipped in uh, 1.4 of Nautobot is the idea of job hooks. And fundamentally what this is, is event-based automation. So what we're doing is hooking up the execution of a job to happen automatically when certain types of events occur within Nautobot. And right now those are data change events. So if you're familiar with the webhook functionality in Nautobot, which is when uh, data is either created or updated or deleted, uh, you can have Nautobot send a post request or, or an HTTP request automatically to an external system to kick off some form of automation. Uh, it's very similar. Uh, it's built on the same principles as the webhook infrastructure. But instead of firing off a request to an external system, you're actually able to execute a job uh, within Nautobot. So very powerful feature set, right? Because we're, we're hooking up events to Python scripts that we're running, right? So, so, so really, um, you know, potentially powerful uh, automation tool here. So that's it for the slides. Uh, let's get into the demo, which is uh, what's every, what everyone is here for, I'm sure. So I'm gonna start off with uh, a comparison, excuse me, a comparison basically of, uh, of, of what it looks like today versus what it looks like if you convert things into a Nautobot job. So I've got a uh, Git repository here of um, some things uh, my colleague Jeremy has, uh, has put together for us. And on the left-hand side here, we've got what would be a traditional uh, robotic desktop automation script uh, that someone would build. Uh, an engineer would build this and they would execute it locally. And the purpose of this script is to actually use the NetMiko automation library to go out and uh, actually log in to some devices and validate their host name against a defined regular expression here. 
uh, and it will print the results and so forth. So uh, it is actually already using the Nautabot REST API to pull the inventory of devices. So um, this is a, a, a realistic scenario in that the organization already has Nautabot deployed uh, and they're, they're using it as the inventory of their uh, network device assets. Uh, but you can imagine, you know, if you just had a CSV or an Excel spreadsheet of uh, your your device management IPs or, or so forth, you could be able to do this uh, very same thing. On the right hand side, what we've done is actually migrated uh, this script to be a, a Nautabot job. And as you can see, it's very similar flow. Uh, instead of using NetMiko in this case, we're actually using Napalm. And the reason for that is uh, because uh, there is built-in Napalm integrations within Nautabot. You, the Napalm library is already installed and available for you. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, we're doing the same thing. We are uh, connecting to a set of uh, network devices, logging into them, and validating their host name against a defined regular expression. But I think what's interesting here is to, you know, number of lines of code in a traditional software engineering um, world is not a particularly interesting or important metric, but you can see there, there's actually a reduction in the number of lines of code in this particular case. Uh, and it's, it's, and we can see that because we've got some basic boilerplate here that defines uh, the job class itself. There's some meta attributes like the name and the description of the job, but then the, the meat of what we're doing is all in this run method. Uh, so, so everything that we were doing over here on the left is being done in this run method on the right hand side here. Um, so let's go back over to Nautobot and let's actually execute that. So this is the homepage of Nautobot. If you've never seen it before, this is what you'd see as you log in for the first time. And again, you know, I'll briefly, you know, I'll spend 30 seconds just to just to pitch the data aspect, right? We've got a multitude of different data models that are supported here, you know, tracking things like your sites and physical locations, your racks. Uh, and then obviously your devices uh, would be a, a, a primary thing that we would look to for a network automation purpose. Um, so this is tracking obviously the uh, uh, information about the device, but also we can track the interfaces. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we can track um, <clears throat> The interfaces on that device as well as what those interfaces are connected to the layer three addresses of those interfaces and so forth this is all built-in functionality within Nautobot. Um, so i i definitely um, implore you to to, to go in and take a look at uh, Nautobot. we have some demo instances if you just go to nautobot.com uh, you can find information on how to get to those uh, demo instances they are publicly available and you can log into them um, today uh, but our focus is under jobs. So that is going to be under our jobs heading in our navigation menu. And we're going to go to the jobs list, what we call the jobs list view. And this is all of the jobs that are installed and available within our instance. And we get some, you know, basic information. Uh, they're grouped together by different use cases. So we've got some that are uh, related to data quality or uh, software device lifecycle uh, reporting and so forth. Uh, we're going to be in these headings, the 02, 03, and 04 for the purposes of our demo here today. So this is this first one is that job that we were just looking at, um, verify hostname patterns for NYC. So if we click on this uh, run button here, uh, we're taken to this uh, input here. Now, this job does not require any input. And that's because uh, if we remember our use case here, uh, we've defined uh, that we want to look at a particular set of devices. In this case, the job is hard coded to look at all devices in the NYC site. So what's happening in the job is we're querying uh, the Nautobot data to find all devices that belong to a site called New York City. So there, there's no input that's actually needed here. So we'll go ahead and uh, execute the job now once immediately. And we can see that it's running. And this is asynchronous, right? So um, our, our web UI is not uh, held up waiting uh, for the execution of this job. And there's separate worker instances within the environment here that are actually executing this job in an asynchronous fashion. So that's how we get that uh, scalability. So uh, as we can see what's happened here, is we've identified a set of devices that belong to uh, the NYC site. And we can see from their host name that they're obviously related to that site. 
uh, and we have logged into those devices using the Napalm library. We have validated their host name against a defined regular expression, and we have issued log messages from the job for each of those devices. All of these uh, appear to pass. So if we saw a failure, and we'll see a failure, excuse me, in a, we'll, we'll, we'll see a failure in a moment in a later job, uh, we, we would see a different kind of log message here. But, but this is nice for us because uh, I, as a user, came into a web interface, logged in as myself, authenticated uh, as, as as myself in the system. Uh, I was able to execute this job. There's an audit log that I did this, uh, and then that there's a, an audit log of the results of the execution of this job. So I have now validated all of this. Uh, and there's more advanced feature sets, so the job can, um, you know, obviously it could maybe send compile these results and send an email uh, to someone. Uh, it could, you know, produce uh, output that could be downloaded uh, from here via CSV and so forth. Um, those are all options for, for this job execution. But let's go back to our jobs list and let's take a look at a uh, at the second job here. So this is uh, almost the same thing, but what's happening here is that we've got an input where we're going to actually allow the user to select a particular site. So if we execute this job, what we see here is uh, we have an input uh, variable called site. And if I look at this dropdown, it's all of the sites that are defined here. And if we briefly go look under the organization tab under sites, uh, this is going to show us all of the sites. If I open this in a different tab, all of the sites that are defined within Autobot. So these are the physical locations that my organization has a presence in. Uh, but again, the, the, the point being that um, because I am using Nautabot as the execution environment for this job, I have tight integrations to the data that's available here. So very easily I'm able to add this input parameter, which says I need the user to select one site. There's also options for if I want the user to select multiple sites. Uh, as a job author, I can do that as well. But uh, we're going to filter here for um, Jersey City as my site. And we're going to go ahead and execute this job. So instead of NYC, I am looking for all devices that exist in the um, uh, Jersey City site uh, because I selected that as the um, as the input parameter here. So you can see we identified several devices, and in the logic of this job, we're doing a couple of things, um, and and we'll be able to show the code. and And the code is actually publicly available for for anyone. Uh, in, a, in a Git repository we'll go over at the end of the webinar here. Um, but for instance, this first message, we look to make sure that the uh, device that was identified matches a defined set of device types, which is basically a hardware model. Um, this looks like a weird device, right? And the log message is saying that we don't know um, what this device type is. It's not, it's not what it should be. Uh, so we're logging a failure against that particular device. You can see we, we had only one device that actually matched uh, the host name correctly. And um, operationally as an engineer, what I'm able to do now is look at these results and say, okay, well, maybe I want to go log into this device and see what's up with it. And uh, that's actually what Jeremy is now doing uh, in the background uh, as I speak here. He's going to go check on this uh, Spine01 device. And uh, he's going to let me know in a second uh, if he's figured out what's up with that and uh, potentially corrected that on the device. Looks like when I provisioned, I forgot to put the FQDN on it. So we should be good to rerun now, sir. Awesome. Thank you, Jeremy. So we'll be able to actually rerun this job using the uh, handy rerun button up here on the top right. So we'll go ahead and rerun this. And it takes me back to this uh, job with the input that I had selected from the first time. So we're still executing this against Jersey City. I'll go ahead and execute that job. And it'll run through. And with any luck here, uh, we should see both of our spine devices. Yep, there's 01, and we should see 02 pop up here as well. So excellent. So Jeremy was able to uh, fix that problem for us, um, and we could rerun this job to validate that that change uh, was successful. So thank you very much for that, Jeremy. All right, so let's go take a look at our next demo here. So this is a little more complicated one. So this one, we're actually going to pick a device and then pick an interface on that device and then pick a VLAN that we want to assign to the interface on that device. 
So let's go and run this. So the first thing that we need to do is uh, select a site. So let's go to NYC. Maybe, yeah, under New York City. There we go. So what we're doing is actually filtering here. So this is an example in uh, the job where we're actually chaining these, what, what we call field chaining, where we're chaining these fields together. So the device dropdown is now going to only show me devices that match this site. And obviously, if I picked a different site, I would see only the devices that match that site here. So we're going to pick um, the, the, the first spine, so spine 01. And then we're going to pick an interface here, let's say um, Ethernet 6. And before I go any further here, let's actually go look at that particular device. So NYC spine 01. So let's go to our devices. And let's look for New York. And here is spine 01. And let's go look at our interface listing. And what did I say? Interface uh, 6, I believe. So we'll go and take a look here. And um, what we can see is that we don't have uh, any VLANs associated and no uh, 802.1Q mode uh, as well. So there's no VLANs associated with this particular interface on this spine. And you can also use the uh, Napalm uh, actions to pull the configuration and see it live uh, uh, to, to be able to showcase that um, it's actually live and what's on the device and, uh, and, and show the, the implementation. Yes, yes, that is correct. Thank you for that, Jeremy. Uh, so we're going to deploy uh, VLAN uh, 1233. And uh, we're not going to do this as a dry run. We're going to go and commit those changes to the device. So we're going to uh, run this job now. And this is, uh, uh, again, in the code, it's actually logging into that device uh, and deploying the defined VLAN ID to that particular interface. And it says that it was successful in doing so. So we'll actually go back here. We'll go back to our device. And we'll do just as um, Jeremy uh, uh, suggested and we'll go and actually to the configuration tab here and if we click on this tab what not about is actually going to do is use the uh, napalm integration to go and pull the running configuration uh, for this device and we'll see that come back here in uh, just a second and we should be able to validate uh, that the configuration that we just deployed to that device is actually running on it uh, now so this, this takes uh, just a, a moment to do as it is doing it live uh, as we speak. Ooh, got a time out there. Um, yeah, demo gods are not, uh, not wanting to cooperate with us. Um, let me go back here to the configuration tab and we'll try that one more time. Um, but if not, uh, we can have uh, Jeremy log into that device and uh, validate that that was done, and we can we can take his word for it. Uh, uh, apologize for the uh, demo issue here. Okay. Well, I apologize, folks. It doesn't look like that's going to work for us today. But um, uh, uh, you, as I mentioned, you, you will be able to look at the, the code uh, for that example um, and see what it's actually doing using Napalm to actually deploy that configuration to the device. Uh, and we would normally uh, see that. Uh, it looks like our demo environment is uh, having a couple of issues this morning. Um, but we'll move right along. The The final thing that I did want to show uh, is the one of the biggest uh, value adds to using Nautobot jobs is that when we define these jobs, we take those scripts that we were using uh, locally on our devices uh, and, we, and we deploy them in Nautobot. What we actually get for free is a REST API wrapper around those jobs. So not only can you execute them and access them, excuse me, within the Nautobot web user interface here, but they are exposed for access via the um, the, the REST API that Nautobot has. So what I'm going to show you here is a Postman, a couple of uh, Postman examples here. 
Uh, and what we're actually doing is uh, identify, I've identified the first job that we were, uh, or actually the, the, excuse me, the second job that we're using here where we were validating uh, host names based on a particular site. And if we go back to Nautobot here and take a look at that job, uh, what we have to do as a consumer of this is to identify just the the uh, primary key of that device, and that would be under the advanced tab for the information of this device. So we would just copy that uh, that UUID, and then as an API consumer, I'm able to use this particular endpoint here. Um, it's API extras jobs, the identifier for that job, and then the run method. And what we all we have to do is uh, provide the input to that job. And if we remember from that example, uh, we needed to provide a site. So we're able to identify the site that we want as input data here. This is just JSON. And then there's a couple of headers that we have, um, just a, a, an API token. And all of this is documented uh, within our uh, developer documentation for Nautabot on how to uh, obtain an API token and how to uh, make these sorts of requests. Uh, but we'll go ahead and uh, submit this job via the API. And what we get back here is a response that tells us uh, basically that the job has been queued. Uh, and we can see that the initial status is pending. And so what we have to do as a uh, API user now is understand that this is happening asynchronously, as I mentioned before. So there's a job running in the background and we, we have been given an identifier for that job. So uh, basically, and what we're going to do is copy the ID from this URL right here, which is called the job result. And we can follow that link, but I've got a uh, secondary request uh, prepared here already. So it gives us an identifier basically to check in on that job. So when we make this, re this get request to the job results input for that identifier, what we're doing is asking not about, please give me the status uh, of this job. And we can now see that it failed. And if we remember, uh, the reason that it failed was because the job author said that if any of the devices fail hostname validation, I want to fail the execution of the job. Uh, so this it gives us what the input parameters were, what the ultimate result of the job was. But we don't see the logs here. Those are under another endpoint. And all we have to do is take the job results endpoint and append to the end uh, the logs um, suffix and go ahead and send that. And what we get are all of those individual log messages that we saw in the user interface here. So we saw that for uh, spine 01 and spine 02, uh, the configured host name is correct. So those are those individual log messages that we saw in the user interface here. So extremely powerful that basically for free, uh, we get this REST API wrapper around these uh, Python scripts that once were siloed away on, uh, in our desktop environments. So uh, extremely powerful there. Um, I do have one final um, bonus thing that we'll go through since uh, we weren't able to get that uh, configuration uh, lookup to work for us here. So I'm gonna go back over and there's uh, one more job that we have uh, that I can show you all. Uh, it is, uh, under knock tasks. And what this is actually a, a really interesting one and speaks to some of the other data that we have in Nautobot. Uh, it's called the um, email cable plan and rack elevation diagrams. What it will do is when we select a site, as we have done before, and we enter an email address, to go.com. Yep, I typed that correctly, I believe. Uh, what it will actually do is pull the cable plant information that we have within Nautobot. So uh, that's a, you know, speaking to other parts of the data model that we have, we have the interfaces and their connections, we can actually track all of the cable plant connections. So our patch cables, um, all of our um, fiber plant and so forth can be modeled within Nautobot. And so what we're doing is we're parsing out all of those connections and rendering um, an SVG and some other metadata and even the rack elevations, uh, which are pictures of where devices are racked uh, and stacked within a particular rack for this site. We're emailing that to 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 myself here because I put my uh, my email in. 
And if we go over uh, to my email, we can see uh, what I got here. Uh, so this was some of the, the metadata that we got. We built this little table about uh, the, the, the metadata of all of the devices that are in there. So we can see for each row, you know, what rack a device is in, what interface uh, that interface is connected to on, uh, on its remote side and so forth. And there's an SVG in here as well around um, uh, what the, the, the cable plant connections actually look like. So uh, extremely powerful feature set there, um, cer cer certainly helpful from a troubleshooting perspective. Again, that would be in the context of like network operations, wanting to troubleshoot connectivity in a site or just get some more general information and, and things like that. So that does uh, conclude the set of demos here. So what I will do is come back over here and we will open it up to questions. And I can see that uh, there's been a lot of activity in the chat. So I'm sure Jeremy's got uh, some things queued up. Absolutely. And so I've been trying to do my best to answer each one individually as they're coming in, but they're all, all great questions to kind of uh, to use that as talking points as well. So let's start off with the first one. So Eden uh, asked, uh, and I'm, ter I'm terribly sorry if I mispronounced that. I've got I've got a script that logs into ten thousand devices, and does some show version show inventory. So it does a set of show commands. I've used threads for this. Can it be done in not about jobs? I spin up like a hundred threads at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, certainly we would want to take a look at the way that we deploy. Uh, the worker environments. Uh, there's a couple of different ways that we could architect such a solution. You know, it might be slicing up the inventory of devices into multiple different job executions uh, and then kind of aggregating the results. Um, but you can do exactly what you're doing, which is uh, spin up one job and then uh, fork off a bunch of threads. Uh, we do want to be mindful of the way that we do the connection handling um, for you know, f forking for that many threads, um, but it is a possibility, and it is actually a use case um, that comes up in a couple of the not about apps in the ecosystem that are out there today, notably um, in uh, Golden Configuration, because it actually goes out and performs uh, backups of configuration to do its job and in, in actually doing uh, comparisons and whatnot. So, um, great question. Absolutely. All right, so next question that I had was from Rebeth. I'm a DevOps engineer, uh, part of the network product team, trying to build uh, delivery pipelines, planning on leveraging Nautabot for different automation use cases. Question, does this tool have any built-in framework that supports deployments to the Meraki stack? Deployments to the Meraki stack. So I assume you're you're looking for kind of built-in integrations uh, for Meraki. Um, so uh, interesting question, and it actually dives into another topic uh, which uh, we will likely cover in a in a future webinar, which would be uh, what we call our single source of truth pattern or SSOT, and that is the idea of uh, moving data into and out of systems at enterprise scale. Uh, doing more than just blind uh, e, uh, ETL, or we can actually do like attribute level uh, diff comparisons between our local and remote sources of data. And that is very useful pattern uh, for uh, integrations with systems like that, where we might need to onboard devices to Meraki or uh, deploy configuration for interfaces or, or different things like that, right? So um, to your specific question on integrations with Meraki, I believe at Network to Code, uh, we have uh, have some prior art in that space. Uh, I don't believe any of that is currently open source, uh, but I would encourage you to reach out. Um, you know, any, any anything can be built, and we certainly do have the uh, the skill set to to help with that sort of thing. But in summary, um, yes, it it can be done out of the box. Um, I don't believe there is anything out there right now. As of right now, for open source, we have Meraki as a chat ops plugin for Nanobot. So that is one thing you can use to kind of glean some of the methods that we interact with Meraki on the back end. Um, but you absolutely, to, to John's point, the SSOT pattern is like the, the more mature, uh, better option for kind of a long-term larger enterprise support. And some like ad hoc scripting is absolutely possible as well. They do have a very well-documented API. 
And if I'm not mistaken, I believe uh, Meraki has great uh, like sandbox environments that you can check out as well. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Uh, another question from the same user. Um, so talking about not about deployment, so looking to using not about Docker Compose and wanting to understand um, from a backup and persistence uh, uh, capability with the not about Docker Compose uh, pattern. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll take this one. Uh, so the not about Docker Compose project by default is using a host volume now. I'm sorry, no, 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 no. Is using a uh, Docker volume which is going to be storing it in a persistent volume that's uh, that's relative to the Docker daemon. Uh, you can absolutely uh, take that same volume that is used and change it out from a uh, Docker volume to a host uh, volume, by, uh, like a host mount uh, for a volume. Or you can also specify an external uh, database source if you would like and not necessarily have to host your database inside of Docker Compose. Um, with the Docker Compose by default using the host volume, also keep in mind that the database that is loaded is a just a traditional plain Jane uh, Postgres instance. So any type of normal Postgres operations, as far as DB dump and backups and all of your DBA type uh, actions, can still absolutely be performed. All right. Um, We had Joseph ask about uh, filtering input values, which I think you covered a little bit uh, earlier when we're looking at the code and how you can daisy chain them together. That specifically is uh, using the query parameters or query params uh, quart on the input uh, definition. Mm -hmm. Yep, and 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 that is all documented in the in the not about documentation as well on on how to do that. Absolutely. Uh, we had Serge that had a, I'm sorry, Sergey, not Serge, oh, no, Serge, sorry, uh, job results object available uh, in the API, hold on, I'm reading this, ah, any API to add job output, so not necessarily adding to the job, uh, to, uh, to the job output uh, directly in the not about job itself, but enriching the, uh, the job logs from the API. I, I did a quick look on uh, the JSON, I'm sorry, not JSON, the, uh, the Swagger open API spec uh, by browsing to demo.autobot.com and clicking on API on the bottom right corner. And what I was able to see is I'm not seeing a quick patch uh, or post method for uh, the uh, uh, for the expected object. Mm -hmm. So my assumption is going to be that we can only do uh, git and delete operations and that the job logs are meant to only be injected through the actual not about job itself. Correct. Yeah. So, 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 so I apologize. Th th thank you for clarifying that, that Jeremy. I, I understand the question now. Um, yeah, that's correct. So the, the logs are definitely a um, would be considered an internal system model. Um, so they are not uh, able to be widely manipulated uh, uh, from, from that aspect. Obviously, the content of the logs are, is going to be dictated by the job author. So the person mm -hmm. that wrote the code in the job, they define what gets logged. Um, but as an end user, no, you, you wouldn't be able to modify the content of the logs. If I read into your question a little bit more, um, we do have some plans uh, for next year. Uh, so some enhancements to the to to the job framework, uh, where jobs will be able to output things like files uh, and things like that. Um, so that, that that that'll be coming a little bit later on. Awesome. Um, I'm going to skip the ones that I've already answered just for the sake of time. Um, I see Dan Weber is not a lot jobs only for scripts or uh, Python scripts, or can a Ansible playbook be called? from the run method? That is an excellent question. So um, yes, you you do have that ability. Um, the the Ansible project has, has an SDK uh, for the execution of playbooks that you can call from a script. So, you know, technically speaking, the, the jobs framework only supports execution of Python code, but what you execute from that Python code 
is up to you as a, a as an end user. Um, and and there are patterns. Obviously, as I mentioned, you you could utilize that SDK to to execute a playbook. You could do something even more rudimentary of just executing um, you know shell commands uh, from your Python code. Um, depends on your you know um, you know security. Uh, modeling that you choose to do in your organization. Uh, as to that, what I would also recommend is, um, you know, there's AWX or Tower, you know, which are basically, um, you know, jobs equivalents for the Ansible world. Uh, and there is prior art in the uh, community within Nautilbot for being able to call a uh, Ansible playbook via AWX or Tower APIs. Absolutely. Um, and some examples of that, of calling that, if I remember correctly, at the not about uh, chat ops plugin for uh, Ansible. And so one of the uh, chat ops methods is going to be a launch job, if I remember correctly. And so that's some uh, that's some, um, a great example of the, the existing code on how you can launch a not about job. I'm sorry, launch a AWX job from or uh, from not about itself. Um, I've got two more that are unanswered. Uh, one of them is from Haynes. Uh, can the job approval be automated with Nautilus? For example, config validation with Batfish. So if I interpret your question, maybe um, if you want to say you've got like a job that is going to configure the network uh, you don't want to actually deploy the configuration itself until something is um, validated within Batfish. Um, that can certainly be done. I would think that uh, in the current feature set, we probably wouldn't implement that via the approvals feature itself. But uh, that is to say, you can certainly put that gate uh, into your job logic such that you don't want to actually deploy the configuration unless certain conditions are met. One of them in this case could be that um, you know tests pass against what, uh, what what you're doing with Batfish. Absolutely. Um, another concept to kind of you can also kind of think about from this perspective is um, like workflow orchestration. And so when we look at things from the, from that perspective, uh, overarching workflows may consist of, I'm sorry, orchestration may consist of multiple underlying jobs. And so you might have, maybe it's uh, a workflow template in AWX that kicks off the initial job that starts the config generation and does X, Y, Z, and uh, puts the job in a pending approval status for, and then the next step inside of AWX is to kick it over to uh, Batfish through the validation and then AWX fires off the approval via an API call. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting things uh, with the freedom that we have uh, with Python itself on some of those implementations. So a great question. Uh, another question, which uh, we, we touched on a little bit uh, already, but from uh, another one from Edon is can the plugin jobs be called from an outside system? Like create a service now form uh, to change the VLAN. Uh, looks like not about jobs can't be called from an outside from outside via an API. Uh, so depends what you mean by outside in that context, but uh, yes. Yeah, so so one one of you know the the one of the last demos I did give here was uh, a, around the REST API round job. So any job that you define, you not only get that capability uh, to execute it within the the web interface, but you get a REST API for the execution of those jobs. So um, you know, you, you would just need some tooling to hook up, um, you know, ServiceNow to be able to call the Nautobot API, but that's going to be a, a generalized uh, API integration uh, question, not anything, you know, specific to job execution itself. So the answer is yes, you, you, you certainly can do that. Absolutely. Some concepts of having um, how you hook that up by default, uh, ServiceNow does have what they uh, call the mid server, which allow, which is essentially a message bus runner that reaches out and looks for jobs to run internally. So the mid service deployed internal, service now is only SaaS. Other options could be having like an API gateway on the edge and uh, performing 
appropriate filtering on the inbound requests and only allow certain requests coming in if uh, mid-service had an option. So there's several different ways that if you're needing to get an external uh, SaaS or internet API call internal, that can be done safely and appropriately with proper security controls. A lot of great questions. I think that that is all the main ones that I had that I had uh, grabbed from that. Um, let me double check to make sure we, uh, it's not there. So I'm gonna drop into the chat uh, the link to where the content from today is located. So everything today is located in our uh, 2022 NTC content repo. Um, and you'll see a specific folder uh, called webinars and then all about jobs in there where you'll be able to see the two local jobs that were demonstrated that we didn't run, but it was able to show kind of the evolution. And then also the uh, there should be four additional jobs that are in there as well that are actual not about jobs itself. Uh, do keep in mind that not about jobs that are loaded via Git, um, you wouldn't be able to add this repo and then automatically discover them. You would need to have a separate repo that has uh, one parent folder that is jobs, a dunder init pi, and then your jobs defined in there. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we kept all of our jobs kind of uh, co-located. Uh, for the demo, so that easy easy access based off of other patterns we've done for these webinars. Awesome. And Jeremy, have we provided uh, information already on the Slack community? Uh, we have not added the link into chat, but I will grab that. It's slack.networktocode.com, but I will quickly grab it so that it'll make it easy to click instead of... Uh, trying to listen to my caffeine uh, <laughs> caffeine driven driven blather. I'm on like eight shots of spicy bean juice this morning already. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Yeah, that, that Slack community, there's a channel for Nautabot. Um, that, that's the network to code um, Slack community. Uh, and within there's the, the Nautabot channel. Um, and that is an excellent way to get uh, really quick uh, feedback, questions, and answers, and so forth, because all of us from NTC, uh, as well as the rest of the Nautabot community, several hundred members, uh, uh, are are in there and active every day. Awesome. So two minutes over. I think we're at perfect timing. I want to take the opportunity to thank everyone for taking time out of the day to join us on uh, our webinar. I really appreciate all the work, John, that you do within Nautabot itself and taking time out of your very busy schedule to uh, help help the overarching community with understanding the power of Nautabot jobs and how we can use them in our journey within network automation. Absolutely. My my pleasure. And uh, <laughs> I hope to come back and talk about more, 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 more Nautabot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, everyone.